and this is going to determine the range of values that are actually in our partitions. Uh, we require this boundary value, and we're going to talk more about that in a second. In 2012, you can have a max of 15,000 partitions of what you can actually partition data. And I want to say that you were limited before that. In the original version of 2008 and 2008 R2, it was only 1,000. I want to say it went up to 1,500 um, when it went to SP2 for 2008. And I want to say 2008 R2 got it in a service pack as well. Uh, and we jump even higher at 2012. This is not a goal. You, you should sit there and go, my goal is to get 15,000 partitions across my entire table with data files associated to it. The reason that I say this is every single time your database has to open up one of these files, it's got to crack open the header file on startup, and it's got to go, here's the boot page, here's the underlying files that are associated with this particular file. The more files that you have to be able to do this, the longer it can take your SQL Server to start up. So you want to test this out before you go crazy and make 15,000 partitions. Our partition schema is, our scheme, sorry, is actually a map. It's our map that says I'm going to match the partition functions to the actual physical underlying data that we have sitting within our table. So let's talk a little bit about ranges because to me, one of the most confusing things that I want to be able to get my hands on was the ranges and the way they work for partitioning. So table one, we're going to say we got a right range function and our function values are 100, 200, and 300. When we define that, our first partition right there is going to have from negative infinity to 99. We've always got to account for negative infinity and then to the maximum number uh, for an integer value, we're going to say it's, it's a little over 2.5 billion uh, for a big int. It's several spaces beyond um, your integer value. I'm not sure of what that ordinal position is now, but I want to say it's about four or five spaces out beyond trillion. So it, it's quite up there. So we don't, I've got a positive infinity at the other side, but it's not quite positive infinity. It's a quantifiable number. Uh, negative infinity, probably quantifiable as well, but come on, let's, let's just go with it here. So we've got negative infinity to 99, and then we've got 100 to 199. This is very important to keep in mind because it's that very last value that's going to change when we go from our right range function to our left range function. So we've got 100 to 199, and then we've got 200 to 299, and then our very last one, even though we only have three, you always have to account to what is beyond 300. Our very last one is three to positive infinity. So where this changes when we go to left in a moment is just in this first and last value. But it's very, very important because if you were expecting value 100 to be in this partition and you said, I'm going to do a search for all my values that are under or equal to 100 or less than, then we're going to have to look in two partitions in order to complete this search. So if we wanted values 1 to 100 to sit within one partition, we would need to use a left range function instead of a right. If we just want values 99 and less, then we're only going to be using our right range partition. Right ranges I find I use most often in dates because if I define my range as February 1, I don't want all of January and February 1 sitting in this partition. I Likewise, if this is supposed to be February, I don't want missing February 1st to be in this and then uh, March 1st to be in this partition. Dates are where this definitely gets a little bit more specific on what kind of range we want to use. So let's take a look at the exact same table, but now we're going to do a left range of 100, 200, and 300. This time we have negative infinity to 100. And then we have 101 to 200. And then we have 201 to 300. And then we have 401 to positive infinity. And remember, this changes based off the type of partition function that we want to define. So let's do a quick demo of this.
I've got some validation scripts that I'm going to use over and over again for different examples. The first person I ever saw use these on their blog was Michelle Upward. I've got links to, um, to her at the end of this. Uh, she is absolutely brilliant. She's on Twitter at SQLful.com. And this was a really big ad for me, actually being able to use a partition function and call my partition function and the key we're partitioning off of to see where all the data sits in a table. This is very important because I use this to validate all the time when I define my partitions and I start putting data in it. I want to know that at the very top and at the very bottom of that partition, I've got the exact data I expect it to be in there. We'll come to this, back to this in a moment. First, what we're going to do is we're going to create a database called Demo Mini Partition. And what we're going to do is we're going to put four file groups in place. Now remember, these file groups are secondary file groups that go on top of our primary uh, file, a data file that's already created and our, our log file that was already created. What I'm going to do is I'm going to then take these logical file groups and I'm going to tie each one of them to a physical file. You could actually take and span multiple file groups across a particular file group if you wanted to. So you don't have to go one for one, but I'm going to use one for one in a lot of my demos as it makes a little more sense for us to be able to tell what's going on. Then we're going to create our partition function. So let's go ahead and let's create our database real quick. And I'm going to take a look at the GUI as well to show you guys what's going on. Let's see. Here's our demo mini partition. And if you look at our files, you can see we've only got a primary data file and we've got our log file as well. Log and then our primary data. So let's go ahead and let's add these new file groups. Remember, these are just logical. We haven't tied them to a physical file yet. When we look over at our file groups tab of our database property, you can see we now have file groups one through four. When we look at our files, you can see we still have the exact same two that we were using previously. So now let's actually take and create these physical file groups. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the to phrase to specify the exact file group that we want this physical data file to be associated with. If we did not specify this, it would go to whatever the default file group is. And when you first create a database, the default file group will always be the primary data file. 